everybody. It's nice to see your faces again after two weeks. We are very much looking forward to spending the next three hours together and diving into one of Joanne and my favorite topics, meetings. It's hard to maybe believe that that could be a favorite topic, but for me, it actually is. It's something I find to be incredibly purposeful when we can bring together people, bring people together in a way that gets amazing results done and builds relationship in the process. Uh, for me, that, that touches very centrally to my purpose. So we're super excited to start today's session. So let's check in. Um, if everybody has our meeting design uh, with you or in front of you, that would be super helpful. Um, so today's check-in prompts. The first is, how am I arriving to our session? And the second is, what's one thing I'm curious about as we start today's conversation? Who would like to go first? I can go. Um, I am arriving today, <clears throat> just getting out of another meeting with Shannon on the phone. Um, so I've already been very collaborative and productive, which makes me feel good. And then one thing I'm curious about, we use these meeting designs for large meetings. I, I use them for large, important meetings, but I'm curious to learn how to start incorporating them into my like regular mm -hmm. weekly, bi-weekly small meetings, ones that don't have a lot of stakes, um, but could be better ran with better outcomes. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, we'll absolutely be talking about how to scale the approach. So thank you so much. Glad you're here. Who's next? I can go next. Um, Coming to this meeting, uh, just finishing lunch, so I have a full belly, and um, just been kind of like a slow, quiet day, which is a little bit different because the first half of this week was not either of those things. Um, so happy for that and curious um, to, so we use these meeting designs all the time at SIA and virtually every uh, meeting that we have, but there might be some breakdown of that in the virtual version of our meetings as opposed to in-person meetings. So okay. uh, would like to kind of explore that a little bit. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Glad you, your morning has been more calm than the first half of your week. That bodes well for the rest of today. <laughs> Claudette or Suzanne? I can go. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited about what to learn. Uh, the, you know, we've been using, uh, uh, when I started SIA, uh, we were, they were already using these meeting designs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just ready to um, dive into um, what, the, you know, the details of how, why and how, not just what it is, but also why we do it and, yeah. and how, it's, how it's done. Great. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, there's a lot of power behind knowing the why of what exists in the meeting uh, design template. So we will definitely do that. Welcome. Suzanne. All right. Sorry, I've got a little bit of background noise as my daughter finishes up her second to last Zoom because she finishes the school year tomorrow. Oh, um, awesome. <laughs> so I'm arriving feeling a little scattered because it's just kind of starting the work day for me. Okay. Um, but um, I guess, so that's how I'm feeling. What I'm, I guess I'm curious about today is two things, really. One, for meeting design, we've all been trained at, as our organization on um, what was the past collaborative operating system, so very similar to this that Joanne's led us through at least twice now. I have a colleague that does not use this. It's our communications director and fundraising director, and it's just like wildly frustrating to sit through meetings with with that team um and then i guess the second is i'm curious about using this agenda for you know this um hard decision making like oftentimes i go into coalitions and there's sort of like a structure but when it comes time to like some tough decisions that have to be made as a group i need a little help um how you can kind of craft that and, and formulate it so you stay on track, but you can have some good dialogue or conversation, but ultimately arrive at a decision so you're not having a second meeting to make the decision. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, when we get to the section on process and content and we're talking about meeting processes, that's a great place for that conversation. So if for some reason when we're there it doesn't come up, let's make sure that we, we, we take a moment and talk through that. And welcome to you. No worries about the background noise um, or the feeling of um, a little bit of distraction. I'll share with both the, with the team that I have um, two kids here as well today. The oldest one is off with his dad working. They've been, they've been asked to be quiet, but we'll see how that goes. So I may also have some background noise. Um, Joanne, how are you arriving? I am arriving, uh, as you said earlier, super stoked about meetings because we, we really do love this stuff. And the one thing I'm really curious about as we start today's discussion is, um, you know, I often use the word joyful when in reference to the way we run meetings. And I'm curious whether or not y'all are going to believe us by the end of our session together that, joy, that meetings can be productive, powerful, and joyful. That's what I'm curious about. Thanks. Welcome to you. Thanks. Um, and I'll check in and say that I'm arriving, I'm feeling really ready, um, as, I, as I stated when we started. I do love doing meetings this way. Um, I get a, a really, I get joy out of bringing people together and helping them accomplish something amazing. So I'm looking forward um, to sharing that with the team. Um, I guess I'm curious about um, now that as you're all checking in, realizing that across the four of you, you do have familiarity with this way of, of planning and running meetings. Just how can we deepen that, um, that knowledge for you um, and deepen your application? So I welcome you to um, push Joanne and I as we're talking to make sure that we're taking the conversation to a level for you that is new, um, new and different um, degrees of application. Okay, so with that, welcome to all of us. We are at our 11.05 slot and Joanne, will you walk us through our meeting plan? I will. Let me ask you a question, Shan, before I start. Do we want to, what, what do we want to do with slide two? Do we want to just presence that at this point or? Um, sure. Um, so let me just go ahead. Shan, will you just go ahead and just share your screen real quick on slide two and then I can, then I'll share my screen. So this is just a reminder of sort of where we are in our progression just to kind of anchor us in, in time and space. We all need a little bit of extra anchoring in time and space right now, so I think it's okay for us to just remind us that we're in uh, the second section of this uh, four or five part process. So we're in meets, and then th what this is gonna do is it's gonna take us into problem solving and involving stakeholders. Thanks, Shan. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and stop sharing your screen, and then I will share my screen. Let's see. I think this is the right one. Let's see if I can blow this. Did I do this right? Can you guys see my screen or did I, did I mess something up? I can see it. Awesome, great. Um, let's go ahead and review today's meeting plan. Would someone please uh, offer to read out loud the context for today's meeting? Wants to do that. Can't see you. So let's see. Someone who someone who is not on mute. You're on. Someone you have to take yourself off mute if you're going to volunteer. I can. Awesome. Clap it. Um, meetings are the foundational organi organizing unit of our work lives, and they are at the heart of how we accomplish change initiatives that involve our stakeholders. Yet, do, do you ever sit in meetings and wonder, why am I here? Why are we talking about this again? When will this meeting be over? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> do you ever leave meetings regretful of the time spent, uncertain of the work that was accomplished, or unclear about your next steps? Uh, should I read the next paragraph? Yeah, keep going. Yep. Our pressured lives can leave us feeling we have too much to do and too little time to waste. Imagine a world in which meetings are powerful problem solving engine, engines that have stakeholders feeling energized, productive, and even glad to have attended. Imagine a world in which meetings generate the changes we seek and courageously move our work forward. Well, that, 
And so for there, I'm going to pause and say, even though all of us have some training in this, does this, does this uh, context resonate in some way? Raise your hand if, if you don't. Okay, good. So we're, so far, we're still, uh, we're still, we're still tracking. Uh, Cody, will you go ahead and read our intent and our nine intended outcomes for today? Yes. Um, so our intent is to expand our skills to leverage meetings that better support strategic and complex change. And our nine intended outcomes are increased awareness of what makes meetings so painful and so promising, increased ability to articulate effective meeting intended outcomes, increased ability to discern meeting processes from meeting content and why we should care increased understanding of how the meeting plan elements help to create conditions for effective meetings, shared understanding of the five common meeting roles, shared understanding of facilitation and its relationship to leadership, increased ability to address meeting disappointments via application of preventions and interventions, increased confidence of your skills to lead and achieve complex change, and then the last one, strengthened relationship between and among us. Awesome. Thank you, Cody. Thanks, Cody. Questions or comments about our intent or intended outcomes for today? There are none. Uh, one quick question. Yes. I understand that ours is three hours. Is, is nine intended outcomes for like a normal meeting too many? Or should you have as many intended outcomes that you need to accomplish in the time. You got it. Okay. It really depends upon, you know, this, this level of stakes and what, you know, could be, they could be very easy decisions to be made, right? So this is what we felt was sufficient for the nine. We often can get nine things done, even in a regular, like an, an hour meeting, hour 90 minute meeting, you know, depending mm -hmm. on what this is. And this is a training too. So this is, this is going to unfold in a slightly slower but. Yeah, I'm glad I think part of that too, and we'll talk about this, Cody, when we talk about intended outcomes, but if you have a team that's well-trained in a shared approach to meetings, you can also get more done. Yeah. And part of it is aligning on it up front, right? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. kind of what we're doing. Uh, Sarah or Suzanne, would someone care to review the meeting agenda by just reviewing the when and what columns? Who wants to do that? Sarah jumped the gun on taking herself off mute. So Suzanne, you're off the hook for right now. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. So um, when, so at 10.55, we have our early arrival, which we've done, and 11 a.m. is a welcome and check-in. 11.05, we're reviewing today's plan. That's right now. 11.10, uh, we'll take 20 minutes for foundations and trust reflections. At 11.30, we'll do 20 minutes on meetings. Exciting. And uh, 11.50, we'll do 30 minutes for intended outcomes. We'll take a 10 minute break at 12.20. 12.30, we'll spend 15 minutes talking about meeting processes. At 12.45, 20 minutes talking about effective meetings, exciting. And a five minute break at 1.05. Um, at 1.10, we'll take 15 minutes to discuss facilitation and leadership. 125 will take 20 minutes to discuss preventions and interventions. And 145 will review uh, the meeting and have next steps. And then at 150, a checkout. And at 155, adjourn. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or comments about our meeting agenda? If there are none, then I will go ahead and pass things over to Joanne and Shannon to do our first piece of content at 10 after. The item in which we're going to spend 20 minutes uh, just reviewing, uh, just doing a final debrief on foundations and trust. So here we have a four-step process. Uh, what first we're going to do is we're going to take do a, a council round. Uh, I'm going to divide the self-other system and trust into two halves. So we're going to do a council round on just a single key insight from applying the self-other system framework, so putting on the self-other system glasses. And then uh, we're gonna track uh, any remaining questions. I know, uh, was it Cody and Suzanne had a question. And so if you wanna represent that question and then I'll do a quick rapid fire, um, either dialogue to answer or some other proposal to answer your questions. And then we'll turn the uh, council over to talk about trust and then Shannon will facilitate that dialogue. Any questions about that process? If there are none, then uh, Shannon, will you sh uh, share your, oops, sorry, I'm gonna- yep, You have to stop sharing, yep. 
stop sharing. You will share, and then uh, we're going to do a council round of a self other system. So the question prompts are, what's, an, uh, what's a key insight that you had this week, uh, and what questions do you have remaining? Who would like to go first? I can't see you, so uh, just you're just going to have to turn your, take yourself off mute and uh, go for it. So when I did my self other system, um, I think at times I was a little too close emotionally to what I was trying to, to get through. Um, but some insights that I had were, especially in the system, realizing that this is not the problem or the situation is not a personal attack, kind of understanding what are the, their, that system's role and their, um, what they want out of it, I guess. Great. Beyond just what I want out of it. Great. Any questions that you have lingering that are still troubling you? Yeah, I feel like, so Joanne, we've gone through the self other system process one time and I was thinking, at first I was trying to do it like that and then I was like, maybe I'm doing this wrong. So I feel like, are there any prompts or like specific questions that can help us put ourselves in that, in that mind space? Okay, thanks Katie. Who else wants to go next? I can go. Um, so th this is a little bit last week and a little bit this week, but I'm thinking the original, um, I guess, challenge that I was thinking through the self other system uh, with when we, when we first met is still an ongoing thing, as I'm sure it is for most people. But um, I had some additional meetings late last week. I don't know, sort of all a blur. I had some additional meetings with this person and the meetings were a different context than how I normally interact with that person. And I got some insight into systematically SIA, like how that person operates within SIA that I was not aware of. And then um, some of that person's perspective on their work and how it fits within the SIA organization that I didn't know before. And so that was uh, a really good I feel like the self other system helped me see that more clearly where I might not have recognized it previously. Does that make sense? I was a little rambly. Ah, no, that's great. Did you, do you have any uh, remaining questions? Um, I don't think so. Not currently. Oh. They might come up. <laughs> Thanks. Who would like to go next? This is Suzanne. And I think to echo what um, Cody and, and Sarah have shared, um, I found it really helpful to do this almost in an interview style or having the buddy. And I was just wondering if that's something, you know, like we should carry forward in our process because it is so helpful to have a, a neutral set of eyes um, to talk to and talk with. Um, and I think that ties into the question I had about prompts. Like if you're helping a colleague work through a self other system or you're working through it yourself, what are some of those neutral questions that can help you? Um, kind of dig into that more. Great, thank you. Claudette? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, it would be helpful to have uh, a different set of eyes uh, looking at the whole process and going through it, it was kind of like, okay, um, Uh, let's see, my mind is rambling right now. Uh, I think it was trusting the process, kind of when you're, you have a process down, just um, make sure you trust your, that the process is going to work, even if it doesn't seem like it's working at the moment. Um, and just being calm, you know, hopefully the process should calm you down you know, to make you know that, okay, well, it's going to work out. Just stick to what the plan is. So, you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm just not doing enough. I'm not saying the right things. I'm not doing the right things. And it's like, but you have this process in place, just 
due to process. And, you know, the, the outcome will be better if you just stick to your plan. So that was one thing that, um, that came out of that. Okay. And did you have any remaining questions? Mm, I think there was um, a little bit of a confusion between the, there were two parts for the self. So it's the self, um, how we. Oh, in, that's in trust. Yeah, trust for ourselves and then how others view us, which, you know, I guess it was kind of hard to distinguish. And then it's like, um, you, yeah, having other people, uh, another set of eyes helps. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so it sounds like you guys, uh, Lise Claudette, when you talk about process, you're talking about the trust part of the, the because the self-other system is just a way of looking at the world. It's not really a process per se. It's sort of a matter of process. So I'm curious, when you're talking about trust the process, I, I'm not really clear. I understand what you mean by that. So... I guess sometimes I jump to solutions <laughs> as opposed to questions. So I guess I, in my, when I was working through the document, it was mostly like, okay, here's what I've instituted. Here's what I've instituted. Um, it wasn't necessarily questions. And sometimes, you know, I need to step back and ask the questions. And so when I'm asking so that's, I guess my mind goes straight to solutions, straight to, oh, this is a process. This is something I follow, cross off my, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's and check, have a check box for. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. So I, I'm just gonna finish this section by just saying a couple things and I, I do wanna turn things over to Shannon. Um, uh, for those of you that are applying the self-other system lens already to problem solving, that's so awesome, but we're not going to get to that until next week. We're actually just inviting you to look at the world using this self-other system lens, and it's good that you're struggling with it. That's actually, it's perfect, because you should be struggling with it. Um, and, and so, and there's actually no wrong way to do it. That's the other thing I wanted to say. So uh, uh, Cody and, and Suzanne were asking about prompts. The, the way I often think about self-other system is just to think about any situation. If you're looking at, I hate always going back to COVID, but, um, or something big, let's, let's do something small, like, uh, um, you know, bringing a contractor into my house and fixing something. Um, I have to have the ability to be able to understand this from at least three different levels of perspective. Like, what's my relationship to the problem? I'm the client. I have a broken window. I need to have it fixed. I need to have it fixed tomorrow before it rains, right? But then I have to be able to say, and again, so where, where this ties into the trust is actually then there's a perspective taking, right? So this sort of ties into what we were talking about trust, which is, okay, from the contractor's perspective, what... What's his relationship with it? Maybe he's got 10 other clients also with broken windows, and so he can't get to me tomorrow, right? And then there's a system. Well, maybe because of COVID, all window orders are delayed by two months. And so even though I want to have my window fixed, it's not going to happen because of a system level issue, which is also going to impact whatever situation I'm looking at. So too often we enter in problem solving or looking at the world, just looking at it from our perspective. Like, I just want my darn window fixed. What we were trying to present to you last week was just this ability to start perspective taking. We talked about perspective taking in the sense of high trust relationships, but it also plays into the self other system piece. Like if we're trying to collaboratively solve a problem, it's important for us to understand what's our skin in the game, what the other person's skin in the game, and what's the overall system that uh, that the whole situation is playing in. So the prompts that I like to use are, 
what's my relationship to the situation? What are the other people's relationship? So sometimes that could be one person, sometimes it could be a team, sometimes it could be your program, sometimes it could be your department, right? And then the system level, sometimes when we're thinking about organizational issues, we can think about it, well, I work at Georgia Organics, like what is Georgia Organics trying to do with this? Or what is the larger world, you know, outside? So system can be a, a number of different things, but I think the, the art of the exercise is really this ability to take perspectives from different perspectives of the, at, at different altitudes and also different perspectives from different individuals. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. There's, and, and again, it's just, just a practice. Um, Shan, I'm gonna see if you have anything to add to this before I formally turn things over to you to talk more specifically about trust. I'm trying to think. Um... No, I, th I think that's sufficient for now. Um, the, one, the one thing I would add is that as we talk about self-other system, it is a framework. And as we get more, uh, we get, our skills get more sophisticated, then we can begin to think about who is the other and what is the system. And so that, that can be applied in many different situations. Right. And that will become a part of what we do when we apply self-other system to problem solving. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So when I, when we go through self other systems, should we kind of do like that word vomit? Here's everything that's happening in this situation or this problem. And then kind of what we did, Joanne and Shannon, and then kind of move those into those brackets. Okay. So can you hold that question for next week and maybe, yeah. or maybe we'll take that offline because I don't want to get too ahead of myself because the, the point of the exercise we ask you guys to do is just to put on the glasses and just look at the world. We weren't actually asking to solve any problems. <laughs> we it, sounds, just, it sounds like you did. You guys have the glasses on and now you want to know what to do with them. And that's fantastic. That is good. But I, we're going to talk a lot about that next, next time when we talk to problem solving. So just hang on to that question. I promise it'll be answered next week. Is that all right, Cody? Or we can talk about it offline. That would be the other. <laughs> totally good. Awesome. All right, Shannon, I'm going to turn things over to you. All right. So similar process, um, what's an insight that you have from doing the trust exercise and what's a question that you have if you do? Um, the one thing I want to say that just to distinguish these two exercises is the self-other system was really about just trying on the lenses. Uh, this, when we're talking about trust, the reflections we're looking for are what were your insights or your ahas as you were doing the trust worksheet? So thinking about the relationship that you were considering um, potentially needing to build or rebuild trust. And we asked you to look at that relationship from three different perspectives. So what are your, what were your insights from doing that homework? Who'd like to go? Sarah? I can go. Yeah, um, I think my primary insight from going through the worksheet in particular um, was just reflecting on how much work I need to do as opposed to expecting somebody else to do it. <laughs> I think that's something we want to jump to when you're frustrated with another human being. You want them to fix whatever they're doing wrong and it's hard to always reflect on what it is that you need to do first. So, um, so that was enlightening for me. Great. Did you have any questions, Sarah? Any lingering questions from doing the homework? Um, no, I'm okay. Great. Others, Cody? Yeah, so I would echo Sarah's reflections that it really helped me understand where I played a role in this broken relationship or trust um, and where I feel like I can have an active role in building it back up. Um, a question that I, that I did come up, thought about was, I feel like I rated myself really like low and maybe it's like a female thing where we don't give ourselves enough credit or we can't put our, we can't see ourselves in other people's eyes. But how, like, how do you go about talking to that other person to be like, okay, here's what I'm feeling that you feel about me. Like how do we, like if I rated myself as a five in benevolence, how do I go about being like, I really do have your best interest at heart, even though you, it, 
I feel like you don't think that, you know? Yeah, great, good, really good question. Claudette or Suzanne? Yeah, I did um, think of something uh, this week, um, just talking it out with my daughter and I was like, uh, people have preconceived notions and how do you deal with that? You know, like um, you go from job to job and maybe your previous job, you didn't trust that HR person. And then they have all kinds of memes and uh, people have a viewpoint of HR people. Cause my, um, uh, the situation I used was I teach part-time at the university. And so I am sure the students have preconceived notions about professors and teachers and stuff like that. So that was um, one thing that is like, well, I, um, it's a lack of control in that area. Um, but I, it's something, uh, that's, a, that's something to consider. And that I, I forgot to write down in my sheet was people have preconceived notions of certain groups, of types of folks. <laughs> and it may be just that the experience they've been through or maybe just a societal thing. Um, but yeah, that was one, one part in how to deal with that. Great, thank you. Suzanne? Yeah, I think um, I had similar feelings along their lines as far as insights. Um, it was really, it was just helpful and nice to have time to pause and reflect on this relationship. Um, and I think my question that I have is kind of aligned um, to Claudette's and kind of the idea of preconceived notion, but also like trust building, um, you know, with a, a colleague that, you know, just has a different background and, you um, just wondering what, you know, what behaviors I could exhibit, you know, more of, and particularly around like benevolence and. Mm -hmm. Can I add an insight that I, that Suzanne had on our team call that I thought was really great. She, oh. she mentioned, she's like, you know, this is, we don't allow ourselves time to do these reflections and pause to go through self other system or the trust worksheet. And if we allowed ourselves the time, then like that's how we become good leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other any other insights or questions? Um, okay, I'm going to uh, share a few thoughts and then I think I think in the process of that it'll answer uh, these questions and if not, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little more time there. Um, so a couple things that I, I noticed. So the first is that we do generally tend to rate ourselves um, higher, both on trustworthiness as well as how we would see ourselves from someone else's behavior. So I saw that in uh, the homework of yours that I looked at. I, I felt that in my own experience. So it really validated um, the truisms that we were talking about relative to trust. And I think it's particularly, I think it's a very useful exercise to take the time to look at our own behaviors from someone else's perspective, um, but it's also really hard. And it, what's happening in that process um, is that we're likely making assumptions about what it is of our, how they're perceiving our own behavior. So for me, it points back to, and I think it goes um, to both of these uh, questions, is that it points back to the need that there's no replacement for being in relationship or conversation with someone about your, the level of trust that exists in your relationship. So that was sort of point number one that I wanted to share. Um, so your question, Cody, about how you go about talking to another person about how they may perceive your trustworthiness, um, I think I would, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's not simple, but it's really just about sitting down with somebody else and saying, you know, our relationship is important to me. Um, I want to share um, some feelings or experiences I'm having. Um, I, I'm doing, and you can even use the trust framework, right, to guide your conversation. I want you to know that I have your best interests at heart. 
And when I do X, Y, or Z, whatever the specific behavior is that you're doing from your perspective that you believe is demonstrating benevolence. And I'm wondering how, how is it that you're, you're perceiving or experiencing my behavior? So there's a, a model that, uh, the, uh, the intent and impact model, which we didn't talk about, but it's, it's essentially that we're interested in the in, intent of our behavior, having this, having the, that the impact of our behavior is the, the same as our intent, right? And what, there's a gap that exists there. And we don't necessarily know if there's a gap or not, unless we choose to be in conversation with somebody. So I would use the skills that we talked about in terms of empathy and curiosity and seeking to understand, and I would engage in conversation and, ex and just seek to, seek to understand their perspective of your behavior. Um, I think the same is true on the second question about how do you manage preconceived notions about a relationship. So we all have bias, right? We have experiences with a student professor dynamic, Claudette is an example, or a particular group of people, and those are coloring our interactions with others. And they may be coloring them consciously or it may be unconscious. And part of that is taking the, just being true to who you are, right? Continuing to show up in that relationship in a way that you believe will demonstrate trust and build trust. And then if that is not what's happening, then it goes, goes back to point number one, which is then being in conversation uh, with people um, to, to help them understand your behavior and to seek to understand um, their experience of your relationship. And I'm, I'm mindful that we're a little bit over time. Um, any other thoughts or thoughts or questions? as it relates to trust. Does that help to answer the questions that you have? Yeah, I think that was really good. Okay. Okay, awesome. All right, so with that, um, we are going to move into our 1130 slot. It's 1136. So we're moving into our uh, content on meetings. We have a, how many step process? We have a five step process. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what is a meeting. Um, we're going to do some silent reflection similar to what some of the, the process steps that we did last week. Um, we'll share back on your silent reflections and then we'll talk a little bit more about meetings and we'll take clarifying questions. So let me go back to present mode. All right, so <clears throat> We're going to start moving into our, the bulk of our conversation around meetings um, and their role in creating change and impact. So meetings are, um, I like to say they're decidedly unsexy. Um, they happen to be the thing that Joanne and I really love, but in, but in the context of our organizational work life, they're like, they're pretty unsexy content. However, there's a couple of things that make them, I think, really important. Um, they are the foundational unit of our organizational life. Um, and they are really the primary vehicle where work gets done and relationships are built. They're also the first place that we have to demonstrate self-leadership. So how we show up, and we're going to talk a lot about that, but how we show up in meetings is important. Um, they're also depending on our role where we have the opportunity to lead others. So when we think about um, engaging, leading ourselves and leading others and engaging the system to create change, the sum of that change is likely a series of conversations and events, other, in other words, meetings, right, that are strung together. So the meetings become the, I like to call them sort of the connect the dots of change. So I think it's really useful for elevating our perspective about the role that meetings can play in change, and they're often under leverage for impacting real change in an organization. They're also the microcosms of our organizational culture. So they give us insights into the broader culture that we're working in and the culture in which the change is occurring. <laughs> so some examples, if we think about how do we address mistakes, right? How quick or slow are we at decision-making? How do we celebrate successes? Um, how clear are we when we leave a meeting on next steps and accountability? All of those behaviors are clues to the culture in which we're leading change that are going to give us an indicator of how we might need to um, address our change approach to be most successful. 
So this is a quote from a book that Joanne's currently reading called Emergent Strategy. And so the quote is, while we practice at, what we practice at the small scale sets the pattern for the whole system. So when I think about meetings and I think about uh, what occurs in a meeting, this quote really reflects the idea that meetings are the microcosm of the broader organizational culture and the context in which we're leading change. So with that, I want to ask a question. Um, what is, what's your definition of a meeting? Anybody, just what's your definition of a meeting? Just a gathering of people to, to give highlights of what's happening, at least in some of the meetings that I've been. Okay. So, okay. A gathering of people to give highlights. Sounds like a status. Sounds like a status meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? What are some other definitions of a meeting? Um, a method for communication and or decision making. Okay. A method for communication or decision making. Anybody else? Okay. So let me ask, um, how much let me ask you to with a show of fingers, and I can't see Suzanne, so you'll have to tell me. So if we're curious to know how much time you spend in meetings. So if you spend 25% of your time in meetings, give me one. If you spend 50% of your time in meetings, show me a two. 75% three. Keep your hands up so I can see them. Joanne can see them. And four is 100%. So Cody's a two, Sarah's a three, Claudette, I can't see, there's a two. Suzanne, how many fingers do you have up? Two. Okay, so you guys are spending 50 to 75% of your time in meetings. So the way that we define meetings um, is that two or more people endeavor to accomplish something meaningful in real time. So this is Strello's definition, two or more people endeavor to accomplish something meaningful in real time. So how does that change your response to how much time you spend in meetings? Does it go up? Does it go down? It goes up. The amount that gets accomplished is definitely down. But not for what it gets accomplished, Cody, but how much time you spend in meetings. If you think about that definition, endeavoring to, two people endeavoring to accomplish two or more, accomplish something meaningful in real time, does the amount of time you spend in meetings go up or down? I think for me, it, the, the, the real time part makes it go down, but, you know, we not, might not solve something right then and there. Okay. Anybody else? So are we talking about, like, the difference between, like, having a formal – this is on my calendar, scheduled meeting, and or just like a casual, hey, can we chat really quick about this? Because if I add up all the times that I like randomly chat with people about projects, then it's going to go up. Yeah. If I'm going the other way and counting like how much <laughs> that is actually productive time, it's probably going to go down. But yeah, so just thinking about the definition of two or more people endeavoring to accomplish something meaningful in real time. Those chats I mean, for me then probably count, Sarah. So I'm guessing, yeah. I'm guessing that for most of you, the amount of time will go up, right? Yeah, yeah. So yes. just, just underlining the point that we spend a lot of our organizational life in meetings, right? And they are in, they're incredibly important in terms of how we um, endeavor to get work done in real time and how we accomplish change. So with that, I want to segue and ask you guys, uh, we're on step two of our process. Um, to do a little silent reflection. So there's two prompt questions. The first is, what are your top three meeting disappointments in others? And the second is, what's one meeting disappointment you have in yourself? So we'll just take a couple minutes and then I'll capture responses.
Everybody ready? All right, who'd like to go first? And the way that I'll do this is I'll, you'll share your top three and then we'll do a plus. If, you, if somebody else has the same response, we'll just do a plus one. Sorry, you start. Okay. Uh, my top disappointment, I don't know if I would frame it in that specific language, but the thing that I dislike the most in others in meetings is when people get defensive about their ideas or a project, whatever it is, defensiveness. Okay. Um, not being a good listener, like not actively listening, but just like waiting for your turn to talk. Uh, and then just not being engaged. Like if I see somebody who's like completely distracted and doing something else on their laptop or doing something else on their phone and I know that they're not paying attention. Like I get that we all have to multitask at some level, but you know, if you're totally checked out, then just don't come. <laughs> just tell me you're too busy. Great. And what's a meeting disappointment you have with yourself? Um, for myself, I think that it would be... Uh, I don't know, it's not always defensiveness, but I do feel like um, my emotions like, you know, kind of rise to the top in those moments. And I don't know how to keep that in check all the time. Most of the time, but not all the time. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cody, what do you have? What are your meeting disappointments in others? Um, my biggest pet peeves in others during meetings are no clear next steps. It's just um, that the meeting is just a meeting to talk and not geared towards solving or a solution. It's just re rehashing the problem. Okay. Um, and then truthfully knowing when you're when you're invited to a meeting and the person hosting the meeting has given no clear thought before arriving that day or showing up and your name's on the agenda to speak about something that you had no clue about, that you were supposed to speak about. Okay, great. And what are your, what's the meeting disappointment you have in yourself? Ones that I have in myself um, is that I, I don't give myself enough time to plan or prepare in a way that I think that I should be. Um, and then, I have a hard time managing the time within the meeting and the discussion. So making sure that we're not hearing the same thing over and over and how to, how to respectfully say, we've heard that, let's move on. Um, Great. And I came up with two, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Claudette or Suzanne? I can go, I've just Great. unmuted myself. So for um, disappointments in others, probably echo some of those no agenda um, that's shared or even upon arrival at a meeting. Um, no advanced preparation, like Cody had mentioned, um, among those that might be featured in the meeting. And then, no, and then her point of no idea of clear next steps um, as a result Great. of the meeting. Okay, And Thank then, you. For myself, I think I can, because I like this, the meeting design, sometimes I'll just go through and do it without being as collaborative as I should be on the front end. Okay. So. Great, thank you. Cleta. Yeah, I would say um, uh, folks showing up to the meeting not prepared or not having buy-in. Um, uh, also, I would second the lack of listening, someone on their phone or they're working on something else, they, you know, yep. uh, at the same time. Um, and then for myself, oh, oh, sorry, and for the group, for others, um, too much information too fast. Presenting too much information too fast. And then for myself, uh, I'd second the not enough time to plan or be prepared. Great. Thank you. 
All right, so these are uh, meeting disappointments, very common meeting disappointments that we have in others as well as in ourselves. And we're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to make these go away. And we're gonna first talk a little bit about um, meetings as they apply to leading self and others. So looking at meetings through our lens of self other system. Um, when we choose to lead ourselves differently, we can improve these meeting disappointments. So thinking about the skills that you guys mentioned around active listening and participation and, and preparation, um, leading ourselves is an opportunity um, to engage our head and our hand. So engaging our head, we wanna know what we're doing and why we're doing it. So it, it continues to be about awareness, knowledge, and clarity. We can increase our ability to see and articulate the big picture, right? So it's our responsibility to think about how are we putting the work of this meeting in a bigger, more relevant context, right? That's our leadership responsibility as we think about leading self in meetings and engaging uh, both head and hand. When we think about heart, and this is a little bit about, and we'll talk about this uh, later in the conversation, but around um, uh, our own ego management and emotional control, but engaging or leading ourselves from the perspective of heart in meetings is can we be mindful and more conscious about how we bring our values and our best self to the meeting? So it, it takes some reflection around what's your history with the team or the topic? Um, are you incredibly passionate about it? Where might your own emotions um, perhaps get the better of you and or where can they be in service um, to the work of the meeting and to the work of the team? So that's how we think about um, leading self in meetings. When we move to um, leading others, right, when we lead ourselves well, we increase our ability to lead others. Um, and as a leader, we are responsible for creating the conditions for others to engage with their first full selves. So to collaborate, to co-create, and to work meaningfully. And in the context of meetings, we're deploying our skills such that we can engage the collective wisdom of the team. So again, it's an opportunity um, as the leader of a meeting, right, to engage the whole person, head, heart, and hand. So when we think about um, our common meeting disappointments and we think about our desire to lead and facilitate powerful and productive meetings, and, and to Joanne's uh, goal and her language, joyful meetings, um, and our role is to lead ourselves and elicit, right, the highest and best thinking of others. Um, how do we do that? So there's five questions that we have to address in order to um, design and facilitate powerful and productive meetings. So we're thinking about these five things. We're thinking about what do we want to accomplish. We're thinking about how we should engage in the meeting topics. We're thinking about who is supposed to do what before, during, and after the meeting. Um, we're thinking about the bigger why, so why are we talking about this? Um, and then we're also addressing a when, when will we transition from each topic to cover all of the topics. So these are the five whys that when addressed help to solve the meeting disappointments that you guys have shared and to lead us down the path of powerful and productive meetings. And this is where we're going to start spending, diving in and spending our time. So the first um, area that we're gonna jump into is the what, what do we want to accomplish? Before we transition, any thoughts or questions? Okay. JC. All right, fantastic. Uh, so now we're in the intended outcomes section of our meeting design. We're gonna spend 30 sections, uh, 30, 30 minutes in this section. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of talking, a little bit of table setting, talking about outcomes-based thinking, and then we're going to actually practice. What will be very interesting about this exercise is that Suzanne's had some training in this, Claudette and uh, Sarah have seen this, and I think Cody may have experienced some of this, but I think there's always some room to move the needle for, for all of us. So I'm going to do a little bit of table setting, then I'm going to put you in your breakout groups, and I hope that you will have brought uh, a meeting agenda. And between the, the buddies, we'll just choose one for you guys to, to upgrade. Uh, and then we're going to share out some of our buddy work, and then we'll see um, if we have time for a group discussion. So that's the process. Go ahead and hit the next slide. So the first what that we're going to talk about, there are a number of what's that happen in a meeting, but the most critical one, and the great thing about how this translates 
uh, from meetings to problem solving to pretty much any conversation that you have is this ability to think about intended outcomes. So these are the things, the goals, the end states that we want to accomplish as a result of a particular meeting. Um, the reason why most meetings feel terrible and ponderous and non-productive and non-powerful is because the focus is on the action, potentially, or the topic, and not so much the end state. And so our, one of our superpowers is gonna be this ability to really articulate clear intended outcomes so that our groups know what we're actually here to accomplish. Next slide. All right, so here are some typical, what I would, we would call bad agenda items, and we've all seen these. Uh, things like review action items, discuss upcoming event, give status update. And in fact, one of you checked in and said something like, your definition of meeting is just communicating stuff, which is like, it's terrible. This has, it's like, that should just be an email, right? Why waste a bunch of people's time for a meeting if that is kind of the, the bar in which we have set the purpose for our meetings. So what we're also trying to do is really up the up our understanding and awareness and engagement with meetings. And so we can take up even a bad uh, agenda item and really begin to frame them into something that's an, a goal-oriented or an outcome-oriented framework. So a review action item can turn into a shared understanding of actions resulting from last meeting. So already we've now given purpose to why we are reviewing our action items. We go from discuss upcoming event to a list of possible venues. So we know what the end state is that we're, we're not just kind of randomly having some discussion about tablecloth colors or food, right? Same thing with status update. We go from just simply status update to now we're gonna align around the current status of our project, right? So just by thinking about what our goal state are and being able to articulate that, it already begins to, to raise the bar for what we're actually there to do. Next slide. This is, this I think is like the most exciting, you can think about it, intended outcomes as being exciting, exciting opportunity <laughs> or, or, or intended outcomes. So you have all these actions you want to do. They can essentially be broken down into six different categories of actions. Unfortunately, most meetings are stuck in number one and forget that there are five other things that we could be doing. One of them, is share information. Sharing information sometimes is very important because you, you, sometimes you have questions or sometimes people have different perspectives on the same information. So sharing information definitely is very important. Obtaining input. So the, the other thing is we are raising to our consciousness what is typically implicit or invisible, right? We want to make it, we want to put it on the table and say we want to share information. We also want to obtain input. That's how we get the part of the collective wisdom of the group. Three, not only do we want to obtain input, we want to advance thinking. So again, the bar gets a little bit higher. Four, Suzanne was saying, you know, how do we actually make decisions? We sometimes need to have a particular expressed intended outcome, which is we are going to make a decision on X. By just pointing at that, elevates the conversation and points it in the direction of actually moving forward, making decisions. Five, sometimes we just want to get some traction on something. So we do want to obtain action. And six, not to be understated, especially now in these really tense times in which people are barely hanging in there by their fingernails, building community, caring connection, right? This is all, all about how we begin to demonstrate and live into our benevolence. Their information, obtain, input, advanced thinking, make decisions, obtain uh, action and build community. So these are the six different categories. And if you wanna learn more about this, um, this is the other thing I want to point out to you, uh, especially with decision making, Suzanne. If you haven't gotten great, uh, Sam Canner's book on Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making, there's an entire incredible book on all these different resources about how to make different decisions in different, in different settings and everything. Please, please, please get that book. It's fabulous. It'll really help you expand your toolkit there. Next slide. Okay. So now we're going to take a typical thing that you guys all talk about in your, your lives. So we'll take something as, as useless as fundraising event as an agenda item, right? So useless in that sense. So here is how we can reframe, begin to articulate this idea of having a fundraiser in these six different 
um, activity buckets. Share information, clarity around current status, obtain imp input, a list of speakers, advanced thinking, increased understanding of what we'll do better this year versus last year. So you can do a postmortem, that's advanced thinking. Make a decision, alignment around time and date for the fundraising event, location. Obtain action, you know, a, a list of clear steps with who's gonna do what, when, why, how, right? So these all become specific things you can articulate at the top of the meeting that begin to up the ante of how productive your meetings are. Uh, and then the final line, build community, increase commitment towards having the most successful fundraising event ever, right? So you take a useless agenda item like fundraising event and you can elevate or you can dice it in six different ways. Any questions about that before I um, move on? I'm missing somebody, no, okay, good. Everyone's cool. All right, all right, so next slide. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to practice this art and science of thinking and planning and articulating intended outcomes. The first thing you're gonna do is, I, we gave you a, a handout uh, at the top of this. So the, you have to pull up the handout, the one called intended outcomes, because it certain, has the cheat sheet part that we just showed you on the deck. All right, then I, you're gonna go into your buddy, um, buddy pairs, and in this case, Sarah's gonna be paired with Cody, and Suzanne's gonna be paired with Claudette. I'm not gonna give you 10 minutes, I'm actually gonna give you eight minutes. Um, and so, so the first thing you're gonna have to do is choose one meeting you guys are gonna upgrade, and then the two of you practice writing a couple of intended outcomes, give you eight minutes, um, and then we're gonna pull you back out and the, the thing will automatically pull you back into the full group and then we'll share out the group and we'll see what time, how much time we've got left. Any questions about that before we go into the buddy groups? All right, in that case, I'm gonna hit a button somewhere, what, somewhere. All right, I'm gonna do it and see you guys in eight minutes. <laughs> 